Jeremiah chapter 21. Jeremiah was a bullfrog. Of course, you knew that already, right? Because of the song. There were three gentlemen that were discussing which profession on earth was the oldest profession. One was a surgeon, and the surgeon said, well, you know, the Bible says that God fashioned woman by carving out the rib or the side of Adam, which would make my profession the oldest profession in the world. Being a doctor, being a surgeon, God performing that operation as a surgeon, that makes mine the oldest profession on earth. His friend next to him was an engineer, and he said, yes, but go back a little bit. We know that God created the heavens and the earth and made it out of chaos. Now, that's the job of an engineer. Next to him was a politician who said, ah, but who created the chaos? <laughs> and we know that politicians can indeed from time to time, create their share of chaos. Such were the kings of Judah, and there are four that are mentioned in, or at least alluded to, in the section of Scripture we're going to look at tonight, in Jeremiah 21 and 22. Now, we've given you the names before, but they are such odd names that you probably don't remember them, and I don't know that I'm going to repeat all of them in a row, but we'll get to them. And... Uh, if you're looking for names to name your children, Bible names, I would pass over these names. They're really not worth it. But some of them are quite meaningful. Josiah, we remember him. He was the guy that sort of kicked off the ministry of Jeremiah because Josiah was a good king who brought many good spiritual reforms to the nation. And Jeremiah was the prophet about 21 years of age when he began prophesying during the reign of Josiah. But after that guy, it was all downhill. All downhill with four subsequent kings until finally the captivity into Babylon for 70 years. And so we're going to look at, because Jeremiah prophesies in this section, about all of these kings in some way or another, beginning with the last one first, and then going back. So we're starting with Zedekiah. Zedekiah was the guy who was still around when Judah, the southern kingdom, was taken into captivity. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord when King Zedekiah sent to him Pashur, the son of Melchiah, and Zephaniah, the son of Messiah, the priest, saying, Please inquire of the Lord for us. For Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, makes war against us. Perhaps the Lord will deal with us according to all his wonderful works that the king may go away from us. I mentioned Josiah. He was a good guy. Everyone after him did evil in the sight of the Lord. And each one after him, it seemed, outdid the previous one in evil until finally there was the captivity. Though they had a very prestigious position, being of the lineage of King David, sitting on the throne of King David in Jerusalem, they did evil in the sight of the Lord until the captivity came. I, I read an article, and I, I couldn't trace down the exact tribe, so I can't give you a reference. I wish I could. Um, I heard that there was, and it probably was at one time, I don't know if it still exists, a tribe, a remote tribe in the continent of Africa who had a king, and the king lasted for seven years. That was his reign. That was the stint. That was the length of his reign. After he left and the new king succeeded him, the custom was is that the old king would be killed and the new king would reign. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, no one in the world would sign up for that job. It must have been assigned. Well, it's interesting. In this tribe, 
the king could do whatever he wanted for seven years. He had absolute authority. He could have any pleasure he wanted. There were really no rules for him. There was really no regulations that he had to follow except one. He couldn't change the custom. That there would be death upon the election of the new king. It's the only thing he couldn't change. And again, you'd think, yeah, it's still not good enough. I don't think anybody would sign up for the job. There was a waiting list. The idea of having no parameters and absolute reign as the king of the country for seven years seems to be so appealing even in spite of death. Now again, I don't have the source of that, but as I read that, I thought, that's how most people live. The idea that I can do whatever I want to do, live my life as I please, oh, I know that perhaps one day I'll face God, there will be the judgment, I know I'll die one day, but who knows when that will be, and probably it will be a long ways away, so I'm going to have fun. It seems that this was the philosophy many of these kings took. They made it all about them. They, as the politician, created the chaos. God will create the implement with which to judge them for the chaos. So, Zedekiah, last king of Judah. He knows things are tough. Here's the setting, if I can give it to you, because I'm not going to read all the verses. I'm going to be telling the story and zeroing in on a few of these verses. For 30 months... The Babylonian army surrounded the walls of Jerusalem. Imagine waking up every morning to the blast of foreign trumpets as the armies would gather together, go through their drills, and prepare how to eliminate you. They were getting closer. The siege works were getting stronger. They started to breach the walls. Between January the 15th 588 B.C. and July 18th, 586 B.C., they were there. As the king, Zedekiah, who believed and hoped, maybe against hope, that the Babylonians would turn and run away because the false prophets had come and said, oh, Jerusalem is safe. The walls won't fall down. God will give us favor. And those that were taken away into captivity, they'll be back in two years seems that wasn't working because the enemy was getting closer. So Zedekiah says, we better do something quick, and I guess we better do something spiritual. So you go to the prophet and say, hey, man, pray for us. Now, I think if I were Jeremiah, I would have said, interesting that you asked me to pray for you. I've been telling you to pray for months. I've been telling you to turn back to God, and you have disregarded it. Now, why all of a sudden this change? Well, we know why the change. Their neck's on the line. Pray for us. Look at the answer. As they say, please inquire of the Lord for us, for Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, makes war against us. Perhaps the Lord will deal with us according to all of his wonderful works, that the king may go away from us. Jeremiah said to him, Thus you shall say to Zedekiah. Talk about a gutsy prophet. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I will turn back the weapons of war that are in your hands, with which you fight against the king of Babylon, and the Chaldeans who besiege you outside the walls, and I will assemble them in the midst of this city. I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand and with a strong arm. That's Jeremiah's word to them. Because they were willing to have the man of God, the preacher, pray on behalf of them, but they weren't willing to turn from their own wickedness. Just, would you pray for me, please? So Jeremiah says, go tell your king that God isn't going to turn back the Chaldeans who fight against you. He's going to turn, against, uh, turn you back against them for fighting for them, and they're going to take over this city. And he goes on to say, and kill King Zedekiah, put his eyes out. So here's the word of the Lord, King Zedekiah of Judah. God is going to help the enemies of Israel destroy Israel. That's quite a pill to swallow. 
This bothers us. It bothers our sense of fairness. We think, well, is it safe being one of God's people? I mean, if we trust in God and we're God's own, why would God ever allow anything to happen to his own? This bothered another prophet, by the way, who lived a little bit before this time. Habakkuk was his name. And uh, he cried out against the sense of injustice that he saw. And then God said, hey, Habakkuk, I'm going to work a work in your day that even if I were to tell you, you wouldn't believe it. Well, well, tell me, Lord, what is it? Well, I'm going to bring the Babylonians, your enemy, against you and overrun this city. And I'm going to punish you so severely that in that anxiety, you will be running back to me and I'll restore you. And Habakkuk said, I don't believe it. The Lord said, I told you you wouldn't believe it. But it's going to be quite a work. And he gets really upset with God because it upsets his sense of fairness till finally something emerges out of that conversation. And here's the kernel of that book, and it has reference to this event. He learned to rest in this, the just shall live by their faith. I don't understand it. I don't get it. They're more wicked than we are. God, you think we're bad. The Babylonians make us look good. I know, but I'm going to use them to make you, my children, better. And here's the key. Trust me. Oh, but it's so hard. This hurts. Trust me. The just shall live by his faith. Now, Jeremiah had to cling hard to that faith because it was hard for him to say those words even though they were the words of the Lord. So, down in verse 8. Now you shall say to this people, thus says the Lord. That was the message to the king. This is to the people. Behold, or check it out. I set before you the way of life and the way of death. He who remains in the city will die by the sword, by famine, by pestilence. He who goes out and defects or surrenders to the Chaldeans who besiege you, he shall live, and his life shall be as a prize to him. For I have set my face against this city, for adversity, not for good, says the Lord. It shall be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. What God was telling them, the people, is exactly what he had told them before. Now, you, you probably, if you have a pencil or pen, write in the margin of your Bible, and yes, I'm giving you permission to do that, if you'd like. You don't have to. But write in there Deuteronomy chapters 28 through 30, or just Deuteronomy 30. Because when God made the covenant of the law with his people, this is what he told them. Obey me, everything will be great. Disobey me, everything will be really bad, and I'll send pestilence and famine and enemies against you, and they're going to wipe you out. And he spends two chapters telling them what to do and what not to do and the consequences. He spells out the terms of the covenant. Then, in chapter 30, he says, See, I have set before you the way of life and the way of death, the way of cursing and the way of blessing. Therefore, choose life that you and your descendants may live. So God spelled it out and he said, now you have a choice to make. Obey me, do it. Choose life. Disobey me, you're choosing your own death. So they would have remembered this, those who were astute and tuned into knowing Deuteronomy, and some of them did. Certainly some of the priests understood it. So this is a recap of that. I set before you the way of life and the way of death. It is impossible to be neutral spiritually. I know a lot of people try to be spiritual. You talk to them about the Lord. Well, I don't know. I haven't made up my mind yet. You know, the jury's still out. I'm thinking about this. I haven't decided yet. Oh, yes, you have. To be undecided is to be decided. You made a decision. And I'll ask you, are you following Christ? Well, I wouldn't say I'm really following Christ, but I'm not really against Christ. Baloney. Jesus said, if you're not for me, you are against me. If you don't help gather, you scatter. Jesus made it impossible to be neutral. 
So here it is, guys. I'm standing before you in the city, says Jeremiah. You see the enemy around you. Here's a chance for you to get right with God. I set before you life or death. Now they're coming after you. You want to live and get along and raise families and do all right? Surrender to the Babylonians. You're going to captivity 70 years. You'll be all right. You stay here and resist them. You're toast. We well, didn't say toast. That's the NSV, the new skip version, but same idea. Put in a few beholds and thus saith, and you, you get the idea. Verse 13. Behold, or look, or as I like to say, check it out. Behold, I am against you, O inhabitant of the valley and rock of the plain, says the Lord. Who say, who shall come down against us? Or who shall enter our habitations? They considered themselves, they being the city of Jerusalem, as impregnable. If you ever go to Israel and you look at the city of Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, from the perspective of ancient armies, they were impregnable. You couldn't just march right on up to the walls of Jerusalem. You had to crawl down a rocky valley, very steep, the Mount of Olives, if you're coming on the east side, and go up another steep hill toward Jerusalem, and then there was a wall. So that anybody on the wall could see the enemy climbing down the hill and coming up. On the south, it was also very steep because on the east was the Valley of Kidron, where the Garden of Gethsemane lies. On the south was the Valley of Gehenna, which we call Hell. Gehinnom, the Valley of the Son of Hinnom, where they burned those sacrifices and the rubbish. And it extended all the way around toward the west. So that on all three sides, the city of Jerusalem was impregnable, impenetrable, hard to get to because of the, the rocky fortress. Whenever you'd build cities in those days, you did two things. Number one, you wanted water. Number two, you wanted natural fortification. So if you could find a well or a river and a very steep, rocky, hilly place, that's where you build your town. That's why Jerusalem is surrounded by these hills. That's where they, the Jebusites planted their town. There's only one area where the city is soft. It's weak. You could penetrate it on the north because it's flat. And so that's where they massed most of their defenses, and that's where Jerusalem usually fell to the hand of her enemies. The armies would come, forget the east, forget the west, forget the south, and mash her armies in the north. So there were more watchtowers there. There were more people there. Well, Jerusalem felt in its pride, they can't touch us. You know, we're this rocky fortress. He says, and rock of the plain. That was their boast. We're a rock on the plain. Nobody can touch us. Who say, who shall come down against us? Who shall enter our habitations? Well, pride comes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. The fastest way to go down is to go up in your own estimation. Oh, I'm really something. Oh, I feel so sorry for you. Let me stand away from you when the lightning strikes. You want to be exalted? Humble yourself. Because everyone who is humble, the Lord will exalt. Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time. So that was their pride. That was what the prophet is hitting on in these verses. Thus says the Lord, verse 1, chapter 22. Go down to the house of the king of Judah, and there speak this word. And say, hear the word of the Lord, O king of Judah. You who sit on the throne of David. You and your servants and your people who enter these gates. Thus says the Lord. Execute judgment and righteousness and deliver the plundered out of the hand of the oppressor. Do no wrong and do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless or the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. For if you indeed do this thing, then shall enter the gates of this house, riding on horses and in chariots, accompanied by servants and people, kings who sit on the throne of David. But if you will not hear these words, I swear by myself, says the Lord, that the house shall become a desolation. 
It's as if, though God has already consigned them to judgment, and he has, that he's saying, you know, I'm going to give you another chance. I love this place that is called by my name so much. I'm going to give you another chance. If you just humble yourself and obey me, I'll make sure that these gates are filled with splendor and the dynasty of David will continue. You disobey me. The Babylonians will assume occupation over these gates. And look at the next couple verses, how God describes them. For thus says the Lord to the house of the king of Judah, You are Gilead to me, the head of Lebanon, yet I will surely make you a wilderness. Gilead, one of the most beautiful spots in the land. Uh, We'll be going there in a couple weeks, and we'll be able to point out the land of Gilead from the bus. We won't actually go over to it because it's technically in the land of Jordan and we don't want to worry about border crossings. But you'll see Gilead, the heights up toward the northern part of Israel. Beautiful, green, lush, great pasture land. It was one of the people's favorite spots. God said, you were like that to me. Place of refreshment. You know, you, you probably all have a favorite spot. It could be Hawaii. It could be this one shore in Maui where you like to go hang out, or it could be the Rocky Mountains. And imagine picking your favorite spot. Let's say it's the Estes Park, Colorado. And God's saying to you, you are like Estes Park to me. You're like the the shores of Maui to me. And you go, oh, I can relate to that because that's just refreshing and relaxing. That's how God describes his people. Yet he's setting before them that choice, life or death, and then he will act accordingly. Well, he speaks to King Zedekiah, but go down now to verse 10. Beginning with the last king, Zedekiah, we now move to the first king that succeeded Josiah. His name is Jehoahaz. Very good. Now, Jehoahaz didn't last long. He was only on the throne for three months. Then he was deposed by the Egyptian king. And so we read this. Weep not for the dead, nor bemoan him, but weep bitterly for him who goes away. For he shall return no more, nor see his native country. When he says, don't weep for the dead, he's referring to King Josiah. By this time, Josiah is dead. Josiah was killed by Pharaoh Necho of Egypt. Pharaoh Necho, after Jehoahaz came onto the throne, deposed him, took him away. Josiah is dead. Jehoahaz is alive. And God is saying, you know, it's better to be dead Josiah than living Jehoahaz. Because living Jehoahaz is going to have it really bad. Dead King Josiah has it really good because he was a good, godly, righteous king. (laughs) There's a principle there. And I'll get just blunt about it. A dead Christian is better off than a living heathen. He is. In Psalm 116, the Lord says that he takes pleasure in the death of his saints. And so do his saints. Because if you die in the Lord, you are immediately in God's presence. Do not pass go. Do not collect $500. You are there in God's presence immediately. You go home. You, you know, a Christian dies and we think, it's a tragedy. Yes, it's a tragedy for us. I will not marginalize nor minimize that. But for the person who's died, hallelujah. Oh, but he died so young. Hey, no college tests. <laughs> no income tax issues. No skyrocketing real estate costs in Southern California. No traffic jams. Again, I don't want to minimize the pain that the death of a loved one can create, but if that person knows the Lord, wow. You say, he died. No, he moved. He graduated, man. He's coronated. Two women were dying in the same town on the same night. One was an atheist, one was a Christian. The rooms couldn't be more opposite one from another. In the room of the atheist, all was glum, dark, sad, weeping, mourning. 
No hope, no future, as that dying woman said, I'm leaving home, I'm leaving home, I'm leaving home, and she died saying that. Oh, but on the other side of town, in that bright room filled with singing, that Christian lady was saying, I'm going home, I'm going home. So, hey, just like Jesus said to the women who were, hey, don't weep for me, weep for you and your children, because the Romans at that time were going to come against Jerusalem. Here the Babylonians are coming. So, that's Jehoahaz. For thus says the Lord concerning Shalom, that's an A-K-A, also known as Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, who reigned instead of Josiah his father, who went from this place, he shall not return here anymore. And so he was taken to Egypt. He died there after being a king for three months. Okay, verse 13. Again, we started at Zedekiah. He was the last king before the captivity. Then we went back to the successor of Josiah, who was only there three months, Jehoahaz. Now we go to the second successor, who was Eliakim, whom the Egyptian king changed his name to Jehoiakim. Now remember, you're going to be tested on all these names, so remember Jehoiakim. That's who we're dealing with here. Woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness. Now, he was on the throne for a little longer, 11 years to be exact. Not three months, 11 years. So he had time to, like the politician, create a lot of chaos. And he did. Boy, did he. Look at it. It's hinted here. Woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness and his chambers by injustice, who uses his neighbor's service without wages and gives him nothing for his work, who says, I will build myself a wide house with spacious chambers and cut out windows for it, paneling it with cedar and painting it with vermilion. This king, Jehoiakim, was extravagant. He overtaxed the people. He made them work for free, many of them. You know, he was all into volunteer labor, but didn't pay them what they were worth. Instead, he took the money he should have paid them, and he gave it to Egypt. He gave it to Egypt thinking, the Egyptians will protect me. They formed an alliance together. So the people were overtaxed, while this guy built these cedar-beamed houses like Solomon did. I think he was trying to restore the glory of Judah to be like King Solomon. And painted it with vermilion. Now that is a red dye. And those of, how, how many of you are going to Israel? Raise your hands. How many of you have ever been to Israel? Raise your hands. Okay, so I'm speaking to enough who have been to Masada. And on top of Masada, on the northern part, you can see it's covered by glass now, this beautiful painted palace called the Northern Palace of King Herod. And you can still see the vermilion painted on the plaster walls, this red dye that was very costly. It was hard to get a hold of because you had to all do it by hand. And they painted these extravagant artworks on the walls of these palaces. Well, that's this king, and he used... Uh, the tax money to do it, to build himself. So he was um, using it for his own uh, enjoyment. You shall, or verse 15, shall you reign because you enclose yourself in cedar? Did not your father eat and drink and do justice and righteousness? That's dad, Josiah. Then it was well with him. He judged the cause of the poor and the needy. Then it was well. Was not this knowing me, says the Lord. A few years back, I went over to Baghdad. And I brought in um, 32,000 shoeboxes. So the same that we, collect, we collected this last Christmas. But these were several trucks full of shoeboxes. 32,000 of them. We had a day off, and so we went down to Babylon, the ancient city of Babylon. Always wanted to see it, and I had my camera, so I was so excited. And when we were there, the tour guide pointed out what he called a government enclosure. It was, a very fan it was one of Saddam Hussein's fancy palaces. And he said to us, never mind that building. That's just one of the many government buildings around here, and it is a government building, so we ask that you don't photograph in that direction. Well, 
Since then, we have discovered just how many palaces Saddam Hussein has had. The United Nations said that he built eight huge enclosures, including private lakes and waterfalls and many palaces and um, villas for guests. The State Department, after this last war, determined that Iraq, Saddam Hussein, spent $2.2 billion on 48 private palaces for himself. Very similar to this cat, Jehoiakim. $2.2 million for that many. Then there have been more estimates between 70 and 80 private palaces all around the country. Well, it was interesting. I got to see one of them. I'm sure it looks very different now after this war. I'm sure it's been decimated. But um, I, I have pictures of it. The guy said, don't photograph in that direction. And, uh, you know, my friend was taking pictures, and he photographed in that direction. And while he did, this guy came after him, the tour guide, and yelled at him. He was just adamant that you don't take a picture of that. He opened up his camera and ripped the film out. Well, while that commotion was going on, he was <laughs> <laughs> sufficiently distracted, I could see, that I, I shot several great shots of it and gave it over to Chuck Missler. I figured he'll figure out something with it for his, uh, for his stuff. Anyway, just a little story I thought I'd share. I saw Jehoiakim, and I couldn't help but think of Saddam Hussein. But look at verse 16. Speaking of King Josiah, he's saying, Son, you ought to learn a lesson from your dad. Now, your dad, he was a godly man. He was a good man. He was a righteous man. And look how it's put. He judged the cause of the poor and the needy. Then it was well with him. Was not this knowing me, says the Lord? What is it to know the Lord? Well, 1 John chapter 2 says, Whoever says, I know him, but walks in darkness, is a liar. I think if you were to have interviewed Jehoiakim, hey, Jehoiakim, do you believe in the God of your fathers? Oh, yes, we have this temple and many fine people, including myself. We go to this temple and we worship. But because of his activity, the prophet said, you're disobeying God. That's not knowing God. To know God is to love God, and to love God is to obey him. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Is this not knowing me, says the Lord? It's one thing to make a profession of faith. It's another thing to have the possession of faith. And the possession of faith is evident by the works. You'll know them by their fruit, Jesus said. Faith without works is dead. You know the scriptures. I had a roommate years ago who got interested in running. He said, I'm going to be a runner. So he went out and he bought a book called Running. And I hear at that time it was the textbook on all the dynamics of running, all the physiology of running. He bought the book. He didn't buy tennis shoes. <laughs> he didn't buy shorts or the uniform. He bought a book. And he read the book. And, get this, he underlined sentences in the book in yellow and in ink, and made little notes by them. And I, I look at him, I go, Mark, what are you doing? He goes, I'm reading this book. I said, no, Mark, that's great. When are you going to run? Now, he did almost a year later, once he finished the book. During that time, if you'd asked him any question about running, he was like the resident expert in our neighborhood. He could tell you everything about the physiology of running. He wasn't a runner until the day he put those shoes on and went down the street and applied all of that knowledge he had memorized and underlined and wrote notes about. You see where I'm going with this. We have the book. We underline it. We memorize it. We have yellow marks and pencil marks and all sorts of marks. But here's the prophet saying to this young king, Jehoiakim, your dad, now he was different than you, buddy boy, he obeyed the book. He lived the book. 
He lived in righteousness. And when you do that, that's when you know God. And you, King Jehoiakim, you don't know God. But I got the book. Great. I'm reading the book. Hallelujah. Let me know when you start doing the book. That's the knowing of the Lord that his father was so famous for. Well, the prophecies go on until we get now down to verse 24. And we highlight another king. As I live, says the Lord, though Kaniah, he was the king now right before Zedekiah. Remember we started with Zed, Zedekiah, and then that was the last guy. Then we moved all the way to Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim. Then there was Jehoiachin. And now there is Jeconiah or Kaniah. Or there's another name he went by. Jehoiachin. So I know it's confusing because you think, well, which one was it? I guess it kind of depended what day of the week it was. Today I'll be Kaniah, now I'll be Jeconiah, now I'll be Jehoiachin. But all refer to the same character. As I live, says the Lord, though Kaniah, the son of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, were the signet on my right hand, yet I would pluck you off. And by the way, he was plucked off. He lasted on the throne three months and ten days. He was the hundred-day wonder. That's all he lasted. He was taken over to Babylon because he rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. So the people in Babylon thought he was still the king, but he wasn't. Zedekiah was reigning in his place in Judah. But anyway, let's go back to the prophecy. Though Kaniah, the son of Jehoiakim, or Jeconiah, were the signet ring on my right hand, yet I would pluck you off. Now a signet ring, I have a wedding ring. If I were a king on my right hand, I would have a signet ring that would have my seal on it. And because it had, would have the seal of the king, it would give me identity and authority. Identity and authority. The word Kaniah means establishes. Ye Kaniah means God establishes. This is what God is saying. Kaniah, your name means establishes. Though you are the signet ring, I am disassociating myself with you and disestablishing you. I'm disassociating myself with you and disestablishing you. Though you were the signet on my right hand, I pluck you off. And I will give you into the hand of those who seek your life and into the hand of those who face, whose face you fear, the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, the hand of the Chaldeans. So I will cast you out and your mother who bore you into another country where you were not born, and there you shall die. But to the land to which they desire to return... There they shall not return. Is this man, Kaniah, a despised, broken idol? Is he a vessel in which is no pleasure? Why are they cast out, he and his descendants, and cast into a land which they do not know? O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, write this man down as childless a man who does not or shall not prosper in his days, for none of his descendants shall prosper sitting on the throne of David and ruling in Judah anymore. If you were a Jew in those days awaiting the Messiah, this verse would shock you, what we just read. It's very significant. And I want to unravel it for you. Because if you were a Jew awaiting for the Messiah, you know something about the Messiah. He is going to be of the lineage of King David. So he's going to follow the royal bloodline of King David. There was a dynastic succession from one son passing the throne down to his son, down to his son, down to his son. All the way tracing back to King David. Jeconiah was on the throne. He was deposed into Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. A vassal king, his uncle, Zedekiah, was placed upon the throne until the captivity. But look at that prophecy. Write him down as childless, a man who shall not prosper in his days, for none of his descendants shall prosper sitting on the throne of David and ruling in Judah anymore. If you were to study the ancient rabbis, they have a tough time with this verse because they know what it means. It means that the bloodline of King David is cursed. The bloodline of King David is cursed. 
Now, the Lord promised that David would have descendants that one would eventually sit forever and ever and ever. That's the Lord Jesus Christ upon the throne of David. But now God has a problem. God has cursed the very bloodline he promised would fulfill the Messiah, the King of Israel. And so now we have a huge, huge problem. How to fix that? The bloodline is cursed. Well, when we get to the New Testament, we find something interesting that most people just sort of read over and don't care about. It's called genealogies. You know what a genealogy is. There's a lot of begats in them. This guy begat that guy, begat that guy, begat that, begat, begat, begat. There's a whole bunch of them. And a whole bunch of names we read through and go, ah, forget it. Let's just go on to the real stuff. And we neglect the genealogies until you study them. And you discover something fascinating. Most scholars believe the genealogy that's found in the Gospel of Matthew, of the Lord Jesus Christ, is Joseph's genealogy. And the genealogy in the Gospel of Luke is the genealogy of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And both of them go back to David, but through different streams. If you look at Joseph's genealogy, it's traced all the way back to King David through Solomon, through the royal line, through Jeconiah. But the bloodline is cursed. But that's okay. It's okay because Joseph really wasn't the father of Jesus. He was the stepfather. Jesus was born of a virgin. Now we know why Jesus was born of a virgin. We read the genealogy in Luke and we see the genealogy of Mary also traced back to King David skipping the royal line, going through the son of David named Nathan, not Solomon, skipping the blood curse through Jeconiah. So we look at it and we say, Jesus is related to David, has royal blood via Mary, because Jesus was housed, conceived by the Holy Spirit, housed in the womb of Mary for nine months. So he's related to David genealogically, biologically, and also to David legally by right of his foster father, Joseph. But the bloodline is cursed. You're right. Joseph's not the real dad, just the foster father. Giving him the legal right, but skipping the blood curse. So God cursed the bloodline and got around his own curse by a virgin birth. Now, I, I look at how that is all put together, and I go... Can God keep a promise or what? And because God can keep that kind of a promise with such detailed precision, do, do we have anything to worry about? Anything at all? If God can do that? You know, it's one thing to make a promise. Somebody once said, making promises will get you friends. Performing promises will keep friends. That's why God has so many friends. Because he has made and kept so many promises. And even though God will act in judgment, the curse we bring upon ourselves, God will also act in love and mercy to forgive a world that is condemned. The world is condemned, by the way, apart from Christ. I read a story of two friends who grew up in Australia. One became a banker. One became a judge. The banker, as he developed his career, became corrupt. Extortion and other illegal practices ended him up in jail. It was a high-profile trial, and what made it more intriguing is the judge that this banker was going to appear before was the judge who was the best friend growing up of this banker. Everybody wanted to know, will justice be served? At the trial, the judge was very solemn with his friend, the banker. And he leveled the strictest, most severe penalty he could in the courtroom. And the gavel went down, guilty. And everybody gasped. Wow, the judge really gave it to him. The stiffest possible fine. And then the judge stood up took off his robe, walked over to his friend, began to weep, and he said, I've sold my house, and I have paid your fine. He acted as judge, 
But then he took off his robe and humbled himself and acted as friend to redeem his friend. Can you think of a better picture than that of the Lord Jesus Christ who took off his royal robes in heaven and came down to this earth and said, I'm not calling you servants anymore. You're my friends. Greater love has no man than a friend. A man would lay down his life for a friend. God keeps his promises, and the greatest promise was the cross. And if you haven't received the Lord Jesus Christ as of yet tonight, that's a promise God will keep to you if you let him. He'll forgive you of all your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness if you let him. That's the kind of friend he is. And if you're suffering in any regard tonight or carrying any burden, you go back to the promises of God who keeps those promises with great precision. Let's pray. Lord, you know our conditions, our thoughts, our direction, the things we wrestle with, the things we stew over, the things that keep us up at night. And we reflect just briefly on the promise that you made to this nation of Israel that there would never lack a man to sit upon the throne forever and ever. And then we find this blood curse. And we see how you solved the riddle by having your son be born of a virgin so that when the blood was shed from the cross, it was the very blood of God. As Jesus, conceived by the Holy Spirit, birthed from Mary, has the legal right as well as the biological ties, and will one day come back and rule and reign forever, and for a period of a thousand years rule and reign from Jerusalem as Messiah and as the greater Son of David. So, Lord, we close tonight wanting to make a, a statement of our trust and our faith in you. We bring the things we're struggling with in the light of what we've just read and we realize who we're dealing with. You keep your promises. Fulfill them, Lord, to these, your people. And Lord, I'd pray for anyone tonight who may come with a friend or have come over a period of time and they're not really sure if they have asked you to be their Lord and Savior or if they're living a life of righteousness. We don't know if they really know you, and maybe they've even wondered that. Tonight they want to make sure. They want to make sure that it's not just religion, but that they have made a personal commitment and surrender to you. <clears throat> or maybe a commitment has been made some time ago, and there's just a real desire to re renew that and, and make it fresh and real. As we're praying just now, before we close with a song, with your heads bowed, if you want to give your life to the Lord, surrender your life to him, would you just raise your hand up? Maybe you've never really done it before and just surrendered your life totally to him. Raise your hand up. You're saying, pray for me as you close this service. I'm going to do it tonight. I'm going to give him my life. Just raise your hand up in the air and I'll pray for you. Anyone at all? <coughs> God bless you, sir. Anybody else? Oh, Lord, thank you for your sweet peace that's filled this room and filled our hearts. And we just pray for our brother who is becoming our brother because he's putting his trust in you, in you and because you're becoming his father and he becomes our brother. Fill his heart with peace as Jesus Christ comes into it to assume control. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.